Hey friends, what up? Welcome back to The Daily Dose. Today we're coming at you with day number 111. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 9 through 12 today. We're going to be looking at Psalm number 111 today. So if you are new here, my name is Adam. Thank you for joining me. Appreciate you being here. Uh, you can get a copy of this Bible reading plan that we're using as we go through the Bible over the course of a year down in the description below. Boop! Click on that link and you can download the PDF guide that will walk you through what scriptures we're supposed to be reading each day, so on and so forth. So again, today, Isaiah number 9, chapter 9 that is, through 12, and Psalm 111. So, the first section that we look at today talks about the Lord's anger against Israel. And again, we've kind of mentioned this, we've read about this um, so far in Isaiah at various points up until now. Um, so we've got some more accusations and judgments against Israel and their wickedness. We also have more predictions of God's righteous judgment on the people. Um, we also read about God's judgment on Assyria. Now this is kind of interesting, right? Um, the Assyrians, we read, God is going to kind of use them to spank Israel, to discipline Israel. God is going to use the Assyrians to come and take many of the Israelites captive, right, for a time. But then here, we read that, that God is going to judge the king of Assyria because of the things that he did. It sounds kind of weird, right? You know, like first we read, okay, God is basically sending the Assyrian king and his army to go beat up on Israel, and then God's going to punish them for beating up on Israel. It's like, well, dude, didn't you just send them to do that, and now you're punishing them? But who am I to, uh, to judge the ways of the Lord, right? But, but more specifically, though, I think that it does make sense. It sounds, it sounds like a contradiction at first. Or not necessarily a contradiction, it just sounds, I don't know what the best word is, you know, wishy-washy, um, but, but I believe that it's, it's grounded and, and that there is reasoning behind it. And even if I didn't, God can do what he wants, so who cares if I think it's reasonable? Um, but, but so it says God will use Assyria as his rod against the Israelites, okay? Now, granted, the Assyrians were very wicked people. They did very, very wicked things. They were very wrong, probably much worse so than Israel, right? So before Assyria did anything to the Israelites, in theory, they were deserving of judgment, right? God uses them to inflict his judgment on Israel, but he can still go back and punish Assyria for all of the wickedness that they did. But specifically here it says... <clears throat> that God will judge the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and for the haughty look in his eyes, right? So maybe after the king of Assyria ended up capturing the Israelites and winning the battle, maybe the king of Assyria said, oh, well, look how strong I am. Look how strong my military is. Look at how cool we are, right? Instead of ascribing the victory to the Lord which ultimately it was the Lord's doing. So from there we go on to look at the remnant of Israel, okay? It says that not all of Israel will be destroyed, but a remnant will be preserved. Now, I think just based on the various things that I've read and the studying I've done, I think that this refers to a short-term prophecy and a long-term prophecy, right? <clears throat> ultimately, not all of Israel will be destroyed, um, during the Assyrian captivity, right? There will be a remnant of Israelites that are brought back, okay? But when we go look forward into the end times in the book of Revelation, um, there is another remnant, so to speak, that we read about being preserved, okay? And I believe that's the 144,000. Um, so anyways, going on from here, we read a little bit about the branch that comes from Jesse. So what is this branch and who is Jesse? Well, Jesse is David's, excuse me, David's father. So David was kind of a branch sort of that came from this guy, Jesse. But I think that it's ultimately talking about the, the, the messianic branch, the ultimate Davidic branch, right? The Messiah who comes from the lineage of David. So I, I think this is definitely a prediction of the coming Messiah 
I think there are predictions in here, possibly about the millennial kingdom, maybe about heaven. And, and then we read a predict, a prediction, um, about God reaching out and bringing back a, another remnant from Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, so on and so forth. Now this could be talking about, um, a, this could be a prophetic vision of when Israel regained their status as a nation, where they were recognized as a state back in the 40s, 1948 or something like that. Um, that was the first time in a very long time that Israel has been recognized as a nation and that a remnant was brought back, so to speak. Anyways, from there we go on to look at a song of praise. Isaiah sings a song of praise to the Lord. Okay. Now, what I wanted to touch on for my point of interest today comes from our reading in the psalm that we've got, right? So Psalm 111. And I want to look at two verses, um, verse number 9 and verse number 10. Verse number 9 says, He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. This makes me think of the, the plan to send Jesus, right? that Jesus dying on the cross for those of us who believe and repent, that, that that was the redemption that God has provided for his people, the ultimate redemption, right? Not a vaccine for sin, like, like the sacrifices of the Old Testament, but a cure, right? Um, Jesus is the, the, ultimate, the ultimate treatment for sin, right? His blood is the ultimate cure for the penalty, of our sins. Now we aren't cured from sin, right? While we're still on this earth, we still have a sinful nature and ultimately indwelling sin, and we're still going to continue to sin in certain ways uh, until we're on the other side of the grave and in heaven with the Lord. But this is very cool. How to me this speaks of of it, prophesying almost the the ultimate redemptive work of Christ on the cross. And then if we go down to the next verse. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We read that a lot. We read a lot about people who fear the Lord, particularly in the Old Testament. And I know you might say, Adam, chill with the doom and the gloom and the fire and the brimstone and so on and so forth. Our God is a God of love. We're supposed to love him. He loves us. And all of that is very true. I don't deny any of that that God is love and that God loves us and that we need to love him, right? But I don't think that we can discount and throw out the baby with the bathwater and and not talk about the importance of the fear of the Lord, right? Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. Beloved, we don't need to have a an irreverent view of God, right? God's not our buddy that we can give advice to and get advice from. He's not our homie that we watch football games with, right? Now, that's not to say that the Bible doesn't describe the Lord as being our friend for those of us who are in Christ, right? We are described as friends. But at the same time, I think that we have to be very careful and realize that God's God, that Jesus is God, and that we are not, right? And I think that there does need to be a sense of, of reverent fear, healthy fear of the Lord. And how can we have wisdom if we don't have fear of the Lord? Because we're told that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it starts. Amen? So let's go about our day today and think about the type of reverent and appropriate fear of the Lord that we must have in order for wisdom to begin being produced in us. So thank you guys so much for being here. I thank you for your time. And um, hey, it was fun. We'll come back and do it again tomorrow. So until we meet again, deuces.